also right now like to welcome uh, we've got our advisor and patron uh, Jamil Khatri who heads uh, the global accounting practice at KPMG and his beautiful wife uh, Mridula who I'm seeing for the first time welcome thank you hi folks so, so good to see you guys and Jeffrey uh, Jamil has played a huge role in us getting our governance better our systems and processes in place uh, making sure our pipeline documents are okay uh, making sure that our follow-ups are okay, making sure that as we scale, we stay out of trouble. So Jamil has been a, a, a great uh, friend, mentor, and a philosopher. And uh, what I would quickly like to do is they actually came to the school, Jeffrey, when you visited. When you came to Mumbai to see the school, Jamil was there. And I know Mridula likes your work. So I want to first throw the question to Mridula. Mridula, what is your favorite Jeffrey Archer book and character? And <laughs> questions you have for Jeffrey. But hey, 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 Amitabh, before you go there, you know, just yes. for the benefit of the group, I don't know uh, whether anybody else was there at the school, but, but I came back, you know, to, truly mesmerized by the fact, Jeffrey, that you pro did not understand the language of the students, but the way you communicated was absolutely fascinating and and we could see the gleam in the in the in the eyes of the children uh, you know in terms of what they took away i'm sure they did not understand a lot of the language that was being spoken but i think the messages kind of hit home and i spoke to a few students uh, subsequently uh, uh, as well and i think it was really really great so thank you very much for being there and uh, it was a great thank experience you. thank you thank you very much i never understand uh, why uh, the Indians above all races on earth are so devoted to my work. It's very, very touching. Uh, no, so thank you so much for this opportunity. I have read every book that mm -hmm. uh, so you've written. Uh, one of the early books that I started reading and my favorite is uh, Cain and Abel, of course. It's a timeless classic and there's so much that uh, I read that while I was growing up and it just gave me so much more confidence on how things pan out, how to, you know, how things turn out and how, you know, politics works, how families work, how businesses work, that one share in the boardroom and how much power it has. So that it, it, it's always been great fun. But I think the best part that I like is always the last line. You have to keep reading. You're building the story in your head, but the last line just changes everything and turns it uh, over. So that's the best part of the books. I'm a great fan of uh, short stories. So a twist in the tale. I really wait for those. Uh, those, those are my absolute favorite. And of course, the latest, the Clifton series, I thoroughly enjoyed the first one. That the, the whole way, the whole pace was set. It's really nice. That's very kind. I, last lines come at the very last moment. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't get the whole it. thinking over your <laughs> head, right? So if you're surprised, so am I. <laughs> uh, it's one of those lucky things. I suddenly get a line or I suddenly get an idea and I can see how that will make the whole book switch in a different direction. And then I wonder how it will end and You've got to deliver a line that will make people gasp. Yeah. Yeah. They've got to gasp. And if they gasp, you've got them. If they don't gasp, you've lost them. But I don't know how it happens, but I've been very, very lucky. Very lucky. I mean, one came today, not the last line. I'm three quarters, more than that, nine tenths through a book at the moment. And a line came today. And it was not there one minute before. So you can, you can never tell. Yeah. yeah. But thank you very much indeed. That's, yeah. that's extremely kind. I, I, I just think, you know, I'm not a ballet dancer. I'm not an opera singer. I do not open the batting for England. All things I'd like to have done. <laughs> I'm a simple storyteller. And that's a piece of God-given luck. That's what it is. It is luck. I work hard. Mary, I'll tell you I work hard because she works hard. So she knows a hard worker when she sees one. And uh, so the hard work is there. 
And I always say to the young people who I see hanging about there, doesn't matter how talented you are, if you don't work hard, you won't make it. I don't give a damn if you're the best. You won't make it. A slogger in the end, working hard, will beat the talented man. Yes, Absolutely. Mridila, did you have a question that you wanted to ask Mary and Jeffrey? Yeah, actually. So, uh, just uh, the last book that you wrote, you have two parallel stories going on. What was the inspiration behind that? How, and it, mm -hmm. it, it is so drastic, right? And still in ways it's coming together. Well, I think it's a simple idea to take the same person and send them to two different countries. I thought that was a fascinating idea to send one same person to America and then send them to Britain on the same day and follow their lives in two different countries. Uh, I thought that was an interesting challenge and I, particularly as they were both, as they were the same person, very capable, and you were going to see what they would do if they landed in Manhattan or they landed in Mayfair. It, 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 that fascinated me. It would be just equally in your country, actually. Uh -huh. Yeah. You look at an Indian who arrives in London and another Indian who arrives in New York. Yeah. They both get to the top. If you swap them over, they'd still get to the top. It doesn't <laughs> matter which country you <laughs> get on with it. And the classic example is the, is the, the Marks and Spencer family in this country. You will have heard of Marks and Spencers. Yeah. Mary and I had the privilege of knowing Lord Seif very well indeed, a dear friend. But he never stopped reminding me that his family ship coming over from Europe docked in Liverpool and it was meant to be going to New York. So they got off the ship and walked to, can you believe it? They walked to Leeds. Wow and built one of the greatest empires on earth. And they, may, and they wanted to go to America. They didn't want to come to England. Wow. That, that's a fascinating answer. And I agree with you about the swapping part. Yes, they would be successful in any country. So yes. there is one last question and we've received this from the audience. It's interesting you say that. Margaret Thatcher once said that if Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, a small island, if Lee Kuan Yew had been born in New York, he would have been president of the United States. He just happened to be born in Singapore. Mm. So, I agree. So, so the question that's coming in is, uh, Mary, uh, you know, you have achieved everything. You've reached, reached, achieved every single award possible from every top university to the government, to being the dame, to, You've seen so much success, right? So, and this question is for Jeffrey, Mary, and Jamil, all three of you guys. That, what do you think after all this is the purpose of life? And do you think that answer has changed after coronavirus? So Mary first, and then Jamil and Jeffrey. Uh, well, I think the purpose of my life is to leave the areas where I've had influence a better place than I found them. I, I strongly believe that. Uh, yeah, I think um, on purpose, and you, you heard you heard this from me, Amitabh, earlier. Uh, you know, I, I think we are in a country where, um, if if you look at what's happening on on governance, and I mentioned this to you earlier. I'm sorry, I'm not kind of talking your philanthropy language, but I tell you on governance, it's very important because. A lot of investors put money in companies uh, and then realize, and, and you know, in, in your part of the world, you're hearing a wire card in Europe. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've been trying to do in India is how do you up the game on good governance wherever we touch? So, you know, you mentioned what I tried to do with you. I think that's equally true to the biggest companies and somebody who's trying to do a cause. And I think that's really what I have seen my purpose to be. I think on one thing that this crisis has uh, shown us is to get our priorities right. I think certain things that we thought were the most important things are probably not that important. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that that's the realization that's sinking in within many colleagues. And I'm sure others on this call will feel that as well. 
the relative importance of certain things uh, one is kind of reflecting on that and hopefully we'll come back you know with some better answers than where we started on this crisis so mm. no that's that's a beautiful <laughs> answer thank you thank you uh, jeffrey well just picking up the comment that's just been made working in government in this country and the united states in my observation over the past 60 years has become more and more difficult and more and more unpleasant. Mm. When I was a young man, sitting in the House of Commons at the age of 29, we had figures who were highly respected in Great Britain and throughout the world. The Alec Douglas Humes, Harold Macmillan, these were men of real caliber who were respected. It's disappointing to tell you now that when I speak to young groups, they don't want to go into politics. They find it very unattractive. They find the being rude about each other the whole time, not helped by President Trump, who's just rude about everybody, <laughs> uh, which doesn't serve any purpose, any purpose at all. And this is even more so with women. Women who are succeeding in life get the opportunity, perhaps at the age of 30, 35, to consider going into the House of Commons. And sadly, they are turning it down. And for me, that's the big change in my lifetime. It's no longer an honor to be a member of Parliament. <clears throat> it's no longer someone you look up to who's giving service. And that's very, very sad.